watching Gears. You're watching Gears. You know, one of the cool things about building a custom car truck these days is that there is a ton of parts available to help you build exactly what you want. Now, of course, that's not really new. I mean, the aftermarket, it's been around since pretty much the beginning when people realized just how cool it was to modify vehicles. What is new, though, is the whole nostalgia market. It's been growing for the last 10 years or so. Now it's possible to build a vehicle that looks like it rolled right out of another era using all new parts. And that is great. But none of this would be possible if it wasn't for one particular product. I mean, a product that drives this whole market and absolutely sets the whole tone and the attitude of your project. Yeah, I'm talking about tires. You gotta have them. And if you're gonna build a nostalgic or a period correct vehicle, you have got to have some vintage tires. Where are you going to find them, though? I mean, you're not going to go down to Firestone and buy something like that anymore, or Goodyear, or BF Goodrich, or anybody. Where do you go? That's what we're going to show you. Let's take a road trip. The place is called Coker Tire. It's located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the owner is a full-on 100% southern car nut by the name of Corky Coker. Now, just in case that you think this is just some average, boring tire store, oh, think again. Everywhere you look is a vintage car. The corners are all filled with old Harleys or Indian motorcycles or Excelsiors. It is an automotive experience. However, when you wander back into the warehouses where all the tires are kept, the magnitude of this operation and what they do here really starts to sink in as you start to see rows and rows of tires that haven't been built in years. What are these here? Stacy, these are uh, 475 16s. We sell a lot of those for front runners of hot rods. I see you got a lot of the wide whites too. Now we, that, we do. are you kind of the only guys that do that? We, uh, all of our tires are made in the original molds or made in new molds from the original drawings and we do a lot of wide whites. This is a, an 82015, went on like a 47 Cadillac up to about 1953. Guys that want to dry that car and want it to look exactly correct, that's exactly the tire to have. Better than putting the old white paint on the side. Huh? Or, or port of walls, you remember those? Oh yeah, port it's stuck on there, yeah. Oh, and they'd flap. And you had a tire that you, that, uh, that you made for a World War II Nazi vehicle, right? Absolutely, we it's have. It's a little ironic there, isn't it? It is kind of fun, it's kind of fun to have, you know, walk through my warehouse and you'll see these, you know, uh, tires for Kubelwagens and yeah. Schwimmwagens and World War II Nazi vehicles and down next to the beat it says, made in the USA. You kind of like that. We kind of like that, that's kind of fun. <laughs> You'll even see some stuff that you never even knew existed. These are called high pressure tires. Okay. They fit uh, cars pre-1920 and the rim diameters are 23 inch and greater. There are rim diameters upwards to 29 inches, but not low profile wides like you see, yeah. you know, the bling bling stuff. The, these aren't the big donk these, tires. The, huh? These aren't donka donk <laughs> tires. These, this right here is for brass era cars. And okay. they're Goodrich Silvertones. And we've got more high pressure tires than anyone else in the world. Now, part of the problem with owning a really early model car is not only finding tires, but also rims. Since <laughs> most of the originals have long since rotted away. So, to fill that need, Coker actually makes new rims so that these cars can keep rolling safely down the road and not end up stuck in a museum somewhere. From shearing it out of a piece of sheet metal, from shearing it to rolling it to welding it, to grinding it, and then rolling it into the drop center style, about an hour. Now, speaking of rims, and the fact that tires are really no good without them, it would make sense to offer complete wheel and tire combinations, wouldn't it? Well, that's what Corky thought too. When they buy a tire wheel assembly, we have the ability to match the rim to the tire, and we've got the equipment to do that. So we ship them out, and they're perfectly matched. They're ready to go. Ready to go. 
So, at this point, you have got the most unique tire store on the planet. It's got one of the most amazing car and motorcycle collections out there. And on top of that, the president and CEO is also the chairman of SEMA. Yeah, it's an amazing story. But there is one more chapter to it. What do you think a guy like Corky Coker would do as a hobby? I mean, bungee jump, skydive, something like that, right? Oh, no. No, he does something much more dangerous than that. He plays the banjo in the South. <laughs> and in true Coker fashion, he's really good at it. <laughs> and that is Corky Coker. Now, I know some of you guys are thinking, after seeing all those classic cars sitting around, do those actually get driven? I mean, do people actually drive that stuff? Well, you're about to find out as we get involved in one of the coolest driving events to ever hit the back roads of America. It was the early 1900s. The automobile was in its infancy. Matter of fact, at the turn of the century, the question wasn't, what kind of car do you drive? It was, do you think the car will ever replace the horse and the train? A lot of people had their doubts. So, to prove that this thing called the automobile was capable of reliable, long-distance travel, a race was devised that started in New York, ran across North America, then to Asia, then Europe, and finally finished in Paris after traveling over 22,000 miles in a grueling 169 days. This was without roads, without gas stations, and without auto parts stores. To this day, it is still one of the toughest endurance races ever devised or attempted. It was simply called the Great Race. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, you know, that's great, that's, that's really cool, but Man, that was a long time ago. What exactly does that have to do with today? Well, plenty. Because a version of the great race is still around. And for the last 25 years, it's been running all across the United States. And it's not only one of the coolest automotive events to see, but it's also something that you can get involved in. Here's how it works. Each car has a team of a driver and a navigator. <laughs> and it's important to pick these well because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them in pretty close quarters. Every morning, you get your map with directions for the route that you'll be taking that day. Then, it's just a matter of driving the course and the allotted time. Sounds easy, huh? Well, that is until you realize that the directions read like this. You go to 30 miles an hour when you see this outhouse, and then I guess you look for a girl with an hourglass figure, and then you go to 45 miles an hour, and then I guess you look for another girl with an hourglass figure with more sand at the top. Yeah, so then you go to 35 miles an hour, and then you drive and drive, and I guess you realize you've been looking at the wrong thing, and now you're completely lost, so then you, you go to a coffee break here at the bottom, and you ask for directions. Yeah, this is is not easy. Ask Mike. Okay, we're gonna do it. See a Nashville half mile sign. It comes yeah. quick. We're gonna blow right through it. <laughs> and if you happen to make a wrong turn, or break down, or get stuck in a traffic jam, <laughs> you better hold on because now you've got to make up time somehow. Oh, and by the way. This is all on back roads and highways. <laughs> There's no interstates here. All right, this is a quick stop. Hey, OK. Like, how quick? Well, it's going to be pretty quick if our credit card will clear. Like, do I have time to go to the bathroom? While Stacy is away here for a minute, we'll put some gas in it, because I've watched how heavy his foot is. We're going to burn some this trip. And we're going to want to just keep going. You're going to want to pass all these guys carefully, and we just need to, to hit it and get it. Now you can start to get an idea of just how much fun this thing can be. Six, 
seven. In running a leg of the race with my good buddy Mike Goodman from Honest Charlie Speed Shop, I quickly found that the hardest part for me was keeping the speed down where it should be. 35 miles an hour. <laughs> 35, I've already passed it. Well, we have to slow down. You got a turn here? Uh, yes. <laughs> The hardest part for Mike was realizing that you can't read the map very well if it's rolled up in your hand. You're supposed to be behind that white car and in front of Corky, really. That's where you're actually supposed to be. The Great Race is open to any vehicle built prior to 1969. And you will be amazed at the vehicles you're going to see running this race. Everything from vintage race cars to muscle cars to sports cars, to hand-built creations. I mean, one of my favorites was this Peterbilt truck thing that used a World War II tank engine for power. And when this thing rolled onto the scene, everybody noticed. However, it's not until you pull into the small towns along the way that you begin to realize the magnitude of this event. Basically, the whole town turns out to encourage the drivers and to check out the cool cars because most of this stuff you would only see in a museum. And that's the magic of an event like the Great Race. Now, the best part of this story is 2008 marks the 100th anniversary of the Great Race. And to commemorate that, they're actually going to run the race from New York to Paris, just like they did back in the day. Yeah, that's going to be really cool. Best part is, it's open to anybody. So this is something that you can get involved in. I know that we probably will, because I can think of at least one vehicle that I would love to drive through China and into Europe and on into France with a big American flag billowing out the back. I mean, can you think of the global ramifications of that? It'd be great. Of course, I'd probably end up in a Turkish prison, you know. <laughs> This next project is for you classic trucks guys, and it deals with the largest and generally the most overlooked area on your truck. And I am talking about the bed. And you know, that's ironic too, because this is usually the first place that somebody will come up and go, what do you got? And you want it to look good. Now obviously, if you want it to look good, you, know, you want to put some wood in there. And the wood that most people use is oak. And the reason is pretty obvious. I mean, oak is some good looking stuff, but what if you want something a little different? I mean, there's a lot of different types of wood out there. I mean, there's, there's cherry, there's ash, there's maple, there's mahogany. Where are you gonna find that kind of stuff? Not gonna find it at your local hardware store, but I've got a source for you. It's called Bed Wood and Parts, and they specialize in custom woodworking and custom bed kits for classic trucks. Now, here's how it works. You basically tell them the year, make, and model, what you're working on, or if it's a custom application like the hauler here, you give them some dimensions, and they will build you a custom wood bed kit in pretty much whatever wood you want. Now take a look at this. This is called Wormy Maple. Now look at the contour and the character of this wood. This is fantastic. Now, obviously this is already cleared, ready to go in the truck, and it does not come from bed, wood, and parts that way. It's up to you to do that. So before I put this in, show you how nice it's going to look, I'm going to give you some tips on how to do a nice finish on your wood. First, obviously, the wood needs to be as smooth and as flat as possible. And even though it comes pretty slick, it's always a good idea to do some final sanding on it with some fine grit sandpaper to get it just how you want it. Also, remember, sharp corners are notorious for causing thin spots in the clear. So, a little trick is to slightly round the sharp edges, and that'll prevent that. Also, don't forget to do the back and the sides. Now, once your sanding is done, it is time for your stain and your sealer. And you can pick this stuff up at just about any hardware store across the nation in whatever color you can imagine. And this is where you get to decide just exactly what you want your wood to look like because you've got a lot of options here. Now, a couple things to remember when you're putting on your stain and sealer. To keep the finish from looking splotchy, apply the stain using long strokes going with the grain the whole length of the board. Also, make sure that you don't leave any little puddles on the wood because those will be darker. And of course, once again, do not forget to do the sides and the back of the board too. 
This will prevent moisture from getting in and swelling the wood. Now, once your stain is on, or if you're skipping that step, it is time for your clear. Now, for that, you've got some choices here. You can use any number of these polyurethanes that you can pick up at your local hardware store with great results. That's what most people do. Just make sure you put on two or three coats. And this is what you end up with. <laughs> really nice. Now, if you want to go even a step further than this and want that wood to lay just as smooth and as slick as glass, well, you'll want to skip the paint on polyurethane and go with a true automotive clear. And you'll just spray that on just like a regular paint job. And here is what that looks like. <laughs> yeah, a super slick piece of wood that you can actually buff and polish just like a normal paint job. Now, I realize doing it this way is a lot more time, a lot more effort, but trust me, you will not find a better finish than this. Now, once you have your wood all finished out the way you want it, now it's just a matter of setting it in place, lining everything up, and molding it in. The final step to this project is to put in our accessories, starting with this 14-gallon moon gas tank, which is going to be killer in this bed. We're going to follow that up with this really cool thinned aluminum battery box that we got from Bitchin Products. Now it is custom made for an Optima battery, so you not only get a good battery, but it looks really cool too. Now hopefully at this point, you've done all your drilling and all your fitting, so it's just a matter of bolting stuff in. But if you've forgotten something or if you've overlooked it and you got to go in and do some drilling and fitting, that's all right. Just make sure that if you do that, that you come in and put some sealer in the holes. Because if you don't, you're going to be asking for water damage in those holes later on. And that is what you end up with. Now take a look at that. What you've got is a bed that's every bit as unique as the rest of your vehicle. And that is what you want. Tooltech, brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals since 1919. You know, when you're working on your rig, eventually you're going to have to get something in or out of a tight spot. And a drill won't do it, a hammer won't do it, man, no amount of cussing is going to do it. Although that might make you feel a little better. Oh, you need a press. And if you don't have one, man, your weekend project just came to a screeching halt. But there's an easy solution, because a press is one of the oldest tools on the market. First up is the Arbor Press. And this is something that everybody needs in their shop or their garage because it is so simple and it is so useful. Basically, you just roll it down onto the part and pull on the lever. And you've got two tons worth of pressing power. I mean, these are great for installing wheel lugs or rebuilding U-joints or wheel cylinders, and <laughs> you name it. This is a handy tool. Now, if you need more than an arbor press, say you're going to press on some axle bearings or something, this is what you need. This is an H-frame press, and this will give you 10 tons of power all the way on up, depending on what size you get. Now, they have an adjustable base here, and they've got all kinds of room to get some really big parts in here. A press like this should be able to handle just about any of your pressing jobs in the shop. And the cool thing is, it's manual, so you don't have to plug it in, you can move it anywhere in the shop and get the work done. Now, you say you need even more than this, huh? Well, come on. There it is, 40 tons of pressing power. And you can get these up to 200 tons if you think you need it. Now, obviously, this is hydraulic electric, very large, takes up a lot of room. But if you need some pressing power, this boy's got it. Now, the cool thing here is not only the incredible pressing power, but it's also the pinpoint control here where you can actually add almost a pound at a time. Now that is amazing. And just in case you're wondering, that is a real egg. <laughs> Come on, Domino. Here, boy. Come on. We got some cleaning up to do. 
Come on over here. I got something to show you that'll help you with your project. Now, most of you guys are familiar with the project planning book. It's a great way to keep track of your project, the things you've done to it, keep it on budget, and that kind of thing. But one thing the planning book didn't have is a way for you to keep receipts with all of your information on your vehicle. So, we have come out with the deluxe project planning book. Now, this has got all the same guts as the original book, but as you can see, after each section, there's a plastic little container here for you to keep the receipts. So the brakes, receipts for your brakes, there they are. The glass and weather stripping receipts right there. This is a great way to keep it all together. Also, we talked to a whole bunch of insurance companies. Man, they're loving this thing because it allows them to do a nice appraisal on a classic vehicle and do a claim on a classic vehicle if they need to do some, some replacements or some repairs or that kind of thing on it. So this can really come in handy down the road, not just building the vehicle. And now, what are you working on? For today's What Are You Working On, we have a retired veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard, 23 years. His name is Ron Pojar. He's from Nixa, Missouri. Take a look at him. Here he is beside his project. Now, you're probably wondering just what exactly that thing is. Well, Ron started out with a 46 Ford pickup and then he hand built everything out of just a bunch of junk. Basically, he chopped it five inches, channeled it down over the hand built frame, which puts it way down on the ground. And then in the front, he stretched it out with a suicide front end, grafted a 37 GMC hood to a 40 Ford hood, and then hand made the grill shell. So this thing is stretched and looking evil. Now, in the rear, he's got a hand built bed and big fat meats tucked up under this. Man, this thing looks like it is gonna hook up. Now, the engine, you're wondering about that. Small block Chevy backed by a four speed. That is a true hot rod. And he's got a beefed up eight inch Ford rear end in the rear. Well, Ron, I believe you're gonna have to go to a nine inch rear end because I think you're gonna blow that eight inch all to pieces with those big fat meats. Now, Ron wraps it up with the following statement. He'd like to thank his wife for letting him live the dream and build true hot rods. Ron, she's probably waiting for you to finish it so she can drive it. <laughs> Don't underestimate her. She knows what's going on. Great job, though. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you've got something worth seeing, send it into GearsTV.com. We'll see if we can get it on the air. All right, you've seen what we're working on. You know what Ron's working on. Now it's your turn. Get out there, work on something. We'll see you next week. <laughs>